So we're talking a lot about market yields moving up and down. You know, how does that happen? How do we as bond investors predict um, and position ourselves to how we think market rates are going to move over time? You know, essentially what drives the fair value for, for bond yields at different points in the cycle? So here I'm considering a fixed rate bond, a South African fixed rate bond, and for purposes of this analysis, a 10-year maturity SA fixed rate bond. So issued by the South African government, matures in 10 years' time. How do we think the value is going to move up and down throughout our holding period? What are the factors that we take into consideration to say, is this bond at this year cheap or is it expensive? So I just wanted to pause here and just quickly run through what we think about as bond investors when we're thinking of fair value. And we at Lorium, um, our bond valuation framework is really broken down into three valuation pillars. We call them our three R's. And if we have to pause on them briefly, we start off our very first valuation pillar is we have to determine what we think fair value is for global bond yields. So developed market bond yields. And for purposes of our valuation analysis, we use what we call the risk-free rate, which is for a 10-year bond, a 10-year bond issued by the US government. So we think that's very low risk, absolutely going to get paid your money back. And that's what we use as our first pillar. However, having said that, here we're considering a bond issued um, with by a South African entity, by the South African government. And in South Africa, we know we've got a very different inflation dynamic over time relative to what they would experience in the US. So here we're thinking 10 year bonds. We have to predict what we think inflation is going to be over 10 years relative to our risk free bond, which is in the US. Now, right now, might not be the best time to really um, explain these differences because the US is. They have an inflation rate above 8%. We in South Africa have slightly just under 6% inflation rate. Very unusual that the US inflation is higher or developed market inflation is higher than emerging market like ourselves. But clearly that's a unique point in time that we're at right now. Over time, we would anticipate that South Africa's inflation rate through the cycle would be higher than the US. So what additional inflation compensation would we then require as investors for investing in an SA bond relative to a US bond? That's the second R. And then the third R is, once again, we're investing here in a South African bond. So it is issued by the South African government, not by the US government. We're facing the South African government balance sheet for repayment. Now, of course, we think we're going to get repaid, but we would require an additional credit risk for taking on SA risk as opposed to facing the balance sheet of the US government. So what is that additional compensation we would require? Those three factors together dictate where we feel fair value should be for bond investments. And I'm going to just very briefly run through some of the thinking around each of those pillars, just to um, really give you insight into these are the issues that we grapple with every day. So these are the big picture things that we think about every single day in terms of where, where we are. Starting with the global cycle, so the risk-free rate, what do we think is fair value for a 10-year bond, really revolves around where are we in the global economic cycle. So that dictates um, a couple of things. So global economic cycle drives global inflation, and then central banks respond to that inflation outlook by increasing or decreasing interest rates. Um, and they also take growth into consideration at the same time. This impacts where we think fair value should be for longer dated bond yields in developed markets, but also impacts what we call the Federal Reserve reaction function. So that's the central bank in the US who sets interest rates. We all have heard of the Fed. And why that's particularly important for us in South Africa is that we are an emerging market and we're a small open economy. And emerging market risk appetite, so all emerging markets together, can be driven by what the Fed is saying. So if what the Fed says drives global risk appetite higher, so it's risk on globally, that impacts us positively. And if the Fed is upsetting the apple cart and we have a risk off of event, that can also impact us negatively. So all of those those components or factors are important to us. We don't just stop at the US, we also consider what's happening in other developed market bond markets, for example, the UK, the Eurozone, Japanese markets. And then the last piece of the jigsaw puzzle I've added here, um, which is probably a session all in itself, but we had recently um, conventional policies at play prior to the global financial crisis. 
central banks had interest rates that they could use. They could increase or decrease interest rates. When the global financial crisis hit, they cut interest rates down to what they call the zero lower bound, so zero, <laughs> and some even went negative, for example, in the Eurozone. And they said, we can't cut interest rates any further, but we need more stimulus in the economy. What are we going to do? And they essentially solved that piece of their puzzle by buying bonds in the market in different ways and under different operations and in different um, strategies to bring the overall cost of money down even further than just using interest rates. So they hadn't done that before. That was a new type of policy mix that was introduced. And during COVID, they just expanded that toolbox even further. Um, we saw central banks buying corporate bonds in the market and doing all sorts of unusual things. You put all of those unusual strategies together and that's called this term called quantitative easing, stimulus that's added to the economy. What we're experiencing right now, you're those of you who, who read the financial press, which you all do, will understand that there's this term called quantitative tightening, which is coming into play. And that's really the US increasing interest rates and now reducing the size of these bond purchases that they had made, and in fact, selling some of the bonds that they have on balance sheet. So all of these factors are important. They all drive the direction for global bond yields, um, and we take them into consideration under this first valuation pillar, which is the first R. Um, I know we've discussed this before. I just wanted to quickly put some of the terminology in. Um, we actually did this at our last web webinar, but we talk as fixed income managers, we talk about dovishness and we talk about hawkishness. And really all that that is, is you know, if you're dovish, it means that a central bank is cutting interest rates, wants to keep rates low, or even cut them further. If a central bank is acting hawkishly, there's hawkishness in their statement, it means that they are looking to increase rates and more aggressively. So that, that's the terminology that we use, um, and it gets used um, a lot in, in fixed income markets. I don't want to give a whole market update um, in this type of forum, but just perhaps very briefly, just to give you some of those pieces of the puzzle that we're thinking about right now. You know, in the US, the US is facing a significant inflation problem. Um, we can perhaps go, if there's time in the Q&A, go into it in a little bit more detail because it's quite complex and quite, um, quite interesting the different inflation drivers um, that, that the US is facing in particular. But we saw inflation start to pick up post COVID for many different reasons. We then saw it surge even further post Ukraine and um, the invasion of, of Ukraine energy prices and food prices increasing. And we're at very, very high levels of inflation in the US. The Fed, however, took a long time to recognize this. So as you can see, the gray line is the federal funds rate, the so short term interest rates in the US stayed at the zero bound for a very long time as inflation was rising and then the Fed suddenly realized well we better do something inflation is too high we can't say it's transitory anymore it's actually not turning around just yet we're going to have to hike interest rates and they're really going from you know, interest rates at zero to raising them as quickly as they can to get policy into restrictive territory to try to bring the inflation rate down so that's what we're experiencing right now a Fed really doing this big u-turn um, and turning course like this big ship turning it really really quickly and trying to lift rates high higher um, there's a couple of tea leaves that we can read along the way and here i've shown you what's called the fed dot plot i wanted to include this in our discussion today because once again these are one of the terms that you know everyone throws around in the market what the fed dots are saying but you know like what does that mean what are fed dots it seems it sounds like such a silly concept and essentially the federal reserve they have they have a, a, lot, a number of meetings throughout the year and at some of those meetings they released what's called the Fed dot plot. Federal Reserve in the US Central Bank, it's a committee made up of a number of different members. And in terms of the dot plot, they just put their forecasts in place. They say, based on the fact that I see right now, I think that interest rates should be at this level this year, this level, next year, this level, the following year, and my long-term interest rate is, is why. And all of those dots then get plotted on a chart, and that's called the Fed dot plot. Interestingly, if you look at that right now, so each of those dots represents one member on the FONC. It's unusual for this dispersion to be so wide. So it just gives you a feeling for the type of uncertain environment that we're in in the global stage right now. Those dots are all over the place. They're normally a lot more centralized. And the blue line just shows you an average of those for what that's worth. It's quite tricky when you're looking at an average of such a dispersion of dots. 
If we look at the purple line on this chart, that shows you what the market is thinking rates are going to do. So this dot plot already is stale, which is odd because it was released in March. But as we know, you know, things are moving so quickly on the global stage, particularly relating to the inflation outlook right now. The market's saying, yeah, those were your dots last time, but we actually think you're going to raise rates even more than that. And the Fed is kind of guiding that they are um, to the extent that we, we said that they cut interest rates to zero um, in the COVID crisis for policy stimulus. The market's saying as early as 2023, so next year, the Fed's already gonna have increased rates from that zero lower bound, they've already raised 75 basis points, they're gonna to get to 3.25% as early as next year. So that's rapid acceleration of tightening um, and it's driving lots of forces in, in global bond markets right now. We can see that when we look at global bond yields. So here we've shown you the US 10 year yield. So this is this fair value that we're, we're concentrating on right now. US 10 year yield has moved from where we were in COVID, which was half a percent. This is the gray line at the top. It was as low as half a percent. That's exceptionally low for bond yields. It rose and then it surged this year. In fact, global bond markets, um, if we look at an index, there's a, a Bloomberg Global Aggregate Bond Index that we look at, which is investment grades are quite high quality bonds, more than 25 countries around the world represented in this index. And that index has had a total return this year to date of almost 12% negative return. It's been a, an incredibly unusual start to the year. We haven't seen a start to the year like this in global bond markets. So all of these forces are very live at the moment and, and driving the outlook for bond yields. We think yields are now pricing in a lot of risks. So we think they're getting to levels that are looking reasonably fair. As I mentioned, we also look at the UK, other developed markets, and Germany, out of interest, if you look at the German yield on the bottom here, that was trading in negative territory throughout the COVID period. Negative yields on bond investments, just as a, that's a very difficult concept for you to get your head around. And once again, later, perhaps in the Q&A, we could delve into that in a little bit more detail. So putting all of that together, we take those factors and we determine what we think fair value is for a 10-year developed market risk-free US bond yield. The second valuation pillar that we were discussing, the second R, is we are in South Africa. We're not in the US. So what additional inflation compensation do we require for that additional SA inflation risk? And that's driven by where we are in the domestic growth cycle, how that drives the outlook for inflation and how our central bank, so the Saab Monetary Policy Committee, how they are gonna to respond to those forces using interest rates. Um, and that's really the complex. That then drives the SA yield curve. And I'm gonna show you some examples of the yield curve shortly. We know that the central bank um, is an inflation targeting central bank. So that helps us. Um, as bond investors, that's, that's a positive. Um, if you are investing in bonds in a country that has a committed and a credible inflation targeting central bank, it certainly helps you to better price long-term inflation risk for those bond investments. Luckily in South Africa, we have that, um, and we have a South that's very independent, very credible, and very committed to, to keeping inflation within their mandate. What is their mandate? It's they need to keep inflation between 3% and 6%. Um, and they actually target the middle point of that range, which is four and a half. Mike, I just oh, wanted to pause there. I think you wanted to... Yes, sorry <laughs> about that. Your turn. <laughs> Give you a second to breathe. So we just do our first poll now. So what I'm doing is just launching, you should see on your screens, an opportunity to vote. So you can select one of those options. And the question is, where will SA inflation peak? So in the charts that Melanie's illustrating, you can see where it has been. And that band of three to six and that sort of middle target range of four and a half. We've currently been trending upwards. I think the last print was about 5.9. Where could we get to is really the question here. And the ranges are above seven, seven, or between six and seven. So I see you all voting there. I'll give you a few minutes to get your votes in, and then uh, I will publish the poll. So that'll pop up, um, but I'll hand back to, to Melanie now. Good. Thank you, Mike. And that was completely a trick question. <laughs> so that was a bit mean of you to do that. Because what we've shown you here is we've shown you the forecast um, in the red dotted lines to the right. But this is before um, we take into consideration that we're likely to have a big petrol price hike in June of around about 3.50. Means that 
Inflation right now is at the upper end of the target range. It's just under 6%. Inflation is likely to peak as high. I hope everyone's finished voting. I can say <laughs> it will peak up to around about 7% if we take that 3 rand 50 into consideration and then come back down again. So this is quite a difficult period of time for the Saab MPC setting interest rates because inflation is going to be above the upper end of their target range in their forecast period. And why? Because we've got high food inflation which is coming through and particularly because we've got very high fuel inflation russians invasion of ukraine spike in energy prices oil prices are a big component of our basket um, and this is something that we can't avoid um, it's, it's a longer subject for discussion i'm going to not go into it right now but perhaps if there's time in the q a we can discuss the the inflation and interest rate forecast a little bit more detail but essentially what do we and just having a look at the results of that poll so the majority between six and seven percent and of course there's a chance that it could peak just above seven percent as well so everybody's right <laughs> everybody's spot on in terms of the inflation outlook um so what do we think about when we're valuing bonds well what is the um sub what are they going to do what is the npc going to do with interest rates how quickly are they going to hike and how does that influence or ripple across the entire curve in terms of fair value at different points um so i'm going to I'm not going to go into the detail now. We can certainly discuss that in more detail um, towards the end. So those were the first pillars. What is fair value for risk free for global bonds? What is fair value for um, the additional inflation compensation we want to invest in SA bonds? And then the third factor is, as we said, we're investing in South African bonds. We're facing the South African government balance sheet, not the US. What is that additional credit risk premium that we want to be compensated for that risk as, as they say fixed income investors? So here, once again, it's a multitude of different factors. Um, we think here in terms of um, an abs absolute risk, so South Africa on a standalone basis, but also we aren't, um, we don't operate in isolation. We are part of an emerging market complex globally, which also has its forces driving it um, stronger and weaker. So starting from an absolute perspective, you know, what are our risks, our credit risks um, that we face? We face a South African government balance sheet. So what, how strong is that? What are those fiscal risks? Are they going in the right direction? Are they deteriorating? Um, and how do we then appropriately price for that? At the same time, we think because we are a small open economy in South Africa, we trade a lot with the rest of the world. What are the external risks that we are facing? Do we require capital from the rest of the world to fund our balance of payments or do we not? That's very important. Um, to answer that question, we look at where we are in the commodity cycle. What is our, <coughs> our terms of trade look like? Um, on a relative basis, what's happening to our ratings dynamics? Are we improving up the rating scale, sovereign rating scale? Are we deteriorating? And then also, as we said, we fit into the rest of the world, what's happening to global risk appetite and flows. Do we think that this is a good time for risk and then we're going to see bond yields rally or is there going to be risk often and that's going to be a headwind to valuations? So a lot of factors that we think about here and we take all of these into consideration in determining the fair value for the third pillar. And just a couple of very quick charts just to show you snapshot point in time are we in a good space or not from this third factor and the answer is yes we are why are we in a good space because we we're talking about where we are in the commodity cycle because south africa is a big exporter of commodities this is very relevant for us and as we know commodity prices um, since the COVID period have been in our favor if we have a look here in red you can see the the, uh, an index of the prices of the commodities that we export relative to the main commodity we export, which is oil in the gray line. And you can see how during COVID, the jaws between those two opened up in South Africa's favor. So we earn more for our exports <coughs> on the commodity side than we do for our imports. And how this then feeds through is we have a positive trade balance and a positive current account surplus. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I just wanted to say that where we are right now, we have a current account surplus in South Africa, which is very unusual. We normally have a current account deficit, and we haven't had these levels of a current account surplus since the late 80s. 
which you know may or may not be good or by itself, but it is good right now because of the fact that we have this huge global rise in yields. We saw that in bond yields. We saw that in the Federal Reserve increasing interest rates earlier in the presentation. It's a time when you can be very vulnerable. And the last time we had this type of global shift in yields was the taper tantrum in 2013, where we had this huge current account deficit, more than 6% of GDP. And we had to be Fund cap, use capital from the rest of the world to fund that at a time where capital didn't want to go to any emerging market. That was a very difficult time. Bond yields shot higher. The rand was much weaker. Where we are right now, we are much better protected with a current account surplus because we're not looking for capital from the rest of the world. So um, very briefly, how does that impact how we're thinking about bonds? Current account surplus means that it protects the rand. We're not bulletproof but we are, have a level of immunity that we don't usually carry in these cycles. So it just means a RAND, it can still weaken, but just trade at levels stronger than it normally would at, trade at in these extreme periods of risk off. Because the RAND's a little bit stronger, it helps offset some of the upside risks to inflation. We're buying South African fixed rate bonds, inflation falling or being better protected is good for that. Um, and lastly, for the fiscal outlook, it's been incredibly important. Um, why has this rise in commodity prices been good for the fiscal? So if we look here, this is the mining sector, what they pay in terms of taxes to the government and both corporate taxes and mining royalties. You can see here, they've always been an important contributor, but really an outsized contributor over the past two years. Um, Minerals Council says that they, their members paid 155 billion, which is this last bar here to the fiscus last year. That's really been very beneficial. When we're thinking about this third pillar, um, one of the big things we think about in terms of credit risk of South Africa is what does our balance sheet look like as South Africa? What is our debt that we carry as a country relative to the size of our economy? And you can see that during COVID, so the gray line at the top, the black line shows you what the debt to GDP ratio forecast was by national treasury um, in 2020. It was nearing, in their forecast period, they expected it to get close to 100% debt to GDP. You don't need to know much about bond investments to know that that's too high. So as an emerging market, you, as you start to go through a 60% debt to GDP level, you know, red lights flash, warning lights flash, um, if you get to 100%, that, that's, that's, not, that's not a positive scenario at all. Luckily, since then, if you look at the red line at the bottom, the budget update we had in February this year shows that forecast has improved significantly. So we're still not at 60%, but at 75, we're moving in the right direction. Despite all of this, you know, we still have very high SA bond yields, so it hasn't recognized this improvement. And why not? Because they're question marks. Is this commodity windfall durable? Um, are we going to see expenditure line items in the budget that currently aren't there, like a basic income grant, which can be very expensive? So there are lots of question marks around these forecasts. But essentially, you know, if you have to speak to any bond investor, what is going to make them more optimistic about the outlook for bonds? And that is if we can grow the size of our economy. So if we can move into a stronger growth rate in the economy, we can collect more taxes from a much stronger economy and our fiscal position will resolve itself. That's what we're looking for. And that's why there's so much focus on these things called structural reforms. There's a blueprint to get growth going. Very, very slow, but, but definitely progressing. And um, it's reflected in our ratings. I've got a section on ratings where we'll discuss it in a little bit more detail. So we say SA bond yields are high. How high are they? Um, and let's have a look at it relative to the past. So this is the so the 10-year point, um, a 10-year maturity South African government bond is trading at round about um, 10 and a half percent. So just over 10 percent, you can see on the right hand side. It's trading significantly higher than that taper tantrum period that we spoke about, which was the last time we had this big shakeout in global bond yields in 2013. Bonds are much higher now than they were there. So we've got that additional protection. And before COVID, pre COVID 2019, we were trading around about 9 percent. So um, yields are substantially higher than that. Mark, I think you wanted to add something in here. Yeah, our next poll. Thanks everybody for voting on the last one. I see most of you are paying attention, which is fantastic and sticking with us. Um, this next poll, which I'm launching now, is just a, a simple survey, a yes, no. Do you think SA 10-year yields have yet peaked? So just interesting to get people's perspective on whether we think we're going higher from this level or we'll start seeing a little bit of 
retracing downwards. So I'll let that one run and Melanie can maybe expand a bit more on, on whether the ups or the downs are likely. Fantastic. So while you're voting, you know, we think that there is a lot of value in bonds at these levels. We think that there is a risk premium priced into bond yields for all of these risks we spoke about in the previous chart. <coughs> but we think that that risk premium is worth taking advantage of. And you'll see that we're constructive on bond valuations throughout all of our portfolios. But essentially, you know, if we bring all of those three factors together, and it's really um, sort of in this, this rainbow building block format um, that we can say, what are what are our fair values for each of those components and what is the sum of those parts so what is our fair value for the us tenure the risk free what additional inflation compensation do we require and then thirdly for sa credit risk what additional country risk do we require for that you add all of those together and you can have um fair value estimate for what you think you should be buying a 10-year bond at obviously if bonds are higher than that fair value you would want to be overweight um exposure to bonds within your portfolio. We currently think fair value is around 9.5%. We're trading north of 10%. So we think that SA bond yields certainly have a lot of value. So back to sort of the basics of bonds um, and just having a look at the outcome there. So it's kind of 50, it's exactly 50-50. Yeah, there's a little bit of uncertainty in terms of the outlook, and I don't blame anyone for thinking that, because I think the global environment alone dictates that there's quite a lot of uncertainty right now um, in terms of you know, where, where global bonds are going to. So what we graphed here, so what is a yield curve? We speak about a yield curve all the time, you know, what is that? And here we've graphed what is the current South African sovereign yield curve? So on the x-axis, you'll see maturity so how long does a bond have until it matures and on the y-axis we've got yields <coughs> which shows you for um, each of those bonds each of those maturity points where is the yield of that bond trading at and when you connect the dots you have what we call um, a yield curve so this is true for sorry i'm just trying to go up here this is true for for any economy so in every single economy there's not just a single interest rate right we've been speaking today about what central banks do with short rates we've been talking about what is fair value for a 10 year point of the curve but you don't only have those two points you've got a whole lot of different bonds that you can invest in with all types of different maturities so there's not just a single interest rate but there's really what we call a term structure of interest rates so it's a yield for each maturity but when you're graphing a yield curve the um, the big rule is that you have to use bonds that are the same quality um, different maturities but exactly the same quality so the yield curves that we'll show you are all issued their bonds all issued by the SA government if you had to put in one issued by a corporate and one issued by the government you're going to be drawing completely the wrong wrong conclusion so same quality of issuer different maturities and every single point then along that curve reflects the market's views of different components of risk and yield curves change considerably over time so the, the, the inter market's interpretation of these risks clearly change over time as well and some examples of factors that drive the shape of the curve in the short end it could be changes to the path of expected path of interest rates and um, will materially influence the short end of the curve um, the longer dated yields can be driven by other factors like if we think that inflation is permanently going to be higher in South Africa, you would require a bigger risk premium, yields would move up or steepen in the long end of the curve. If fiscal risk is deteriorating, you would expect that to, to rise. If fiscal risk is improving, you'd expect the curve to flatten. So those are some of the drivers. A yield curve is normally positively sloped, but there are times that it can invert, and I'll show you an example of that. That's normally seen as a signal of recession risk, which we'll discuss. And if you had to pick up a yield curve of any country anywhere in the world, show me a yield curve right now, I will be able to tell you some critical information about where that country is in its economic cycle. So um, it's a really, really useful tool for us as bond investors. As we said, this was a South, current South African yield curve. One thing I'd like to point out here, it is positively sloped, but it's very, very steep, unusually steep. If you had to graph this curve relative to even other emerging markets, and also particularly developed markets, you would see our curve, the difference between the short end yield and longer dated yields, it's very wide. It's a very, very, very steep yield curve. You do get other types of shapes. This is really a normal curve. This is the curve we took an essay curve from a couple of years ago. 
um, from some time back where the differential wasn't as large between shorter dated and longer dated. And if you see a yield curve like this positively sloped, you can immediately say, ah, this economy from this country is expected to grow at normal rates of growth and normal rates of inflation. So typically long-term investors who are investing in longer dated bonds, they are gonna get a higher reward for taking on this time risk, but the curve's not particularly steep. So those levels of, of, of growth and inflation aren't particularly out of normal, normal levels. You could get a very steep curve like we have in South Africa. This can tell you two different things. So the first one, normally if you were to see this in a country like, for example, the US, a very steep curve, this would be a signal that the economy is gonna grow very quickly in the future. So usually at a, a potential levels. So you have a normal kind of test speed limit in an economy of growth. If growth accelerates above that, above that speed limit, it generally generates inflationary pressures. If inflationary pressures start to rise, you would expect interest rates to increase to respond to that. So that's a normal cycle where you see above um, potential growth rates. Um, more restrictive monetary policy means that rates expected to rise in the future, curve is positively sloped, and as a long-term investor who's going to take risk um, out to 25 or 30 years, you would expect to receive a much higher reward for this risk. So that's normal textbook. What we've had in South Africa is we've had this type of curve, very, very steep yield curve, but as we all know, no one's expecting at this stage for the economy to completely go off to the races and generate these really high growth levels, and also inflation's been reasonably well contained. We're having an inflation episode right now because of oil and food prices but the Saab will bring that back down again so it's not like there's an inflation problem and there's not like a, a nice growth problem where growth is accelerating so why is our curve so steep you know that maybe at first glance it doesn't make much sense but it's a different type of steepness yields are higher on the long end than the short end to compensate investors for these higher other risks like fiscal risks Steepness not driven by growth or inflation, but by this additional credit risk premium that you acquire because the fiscal um, position was deteriorating um, for so many years. You also get what we call an inversely sloped yield curve. So this is um, unusual, doesn't happen that often, but short dated yields can be higher than long dated yields, which seems a bit of a paradox because why, if you were going to take a 30 year bond, why would you accept a lower yield than if you were only going to lock your money up for short periods of time? And the reason is because investors investing in those long dated bonds and this type of curve think that rates are going to go even lower over time. So they want to lock in the current rates before they fall. And usually when you see an inverted curve, it normally happens just before a recession. And why do I say that? Well, let's have a look at this chart here. And it's quite a busy chart. So just look at the green dotted line. This is in the US. So it takes the US two-year bond yield and it takes the US 10-year bond yield at every single point in time, all the way back to 1955. And normally the 10-year bond yield trades at a higher yield than the two-year bond yield. So you have a positively sloped yield curve. So when those lines are above the point zero, it will be a positively sloped yield curve. But sometimes that reverts and inverts and two-year yields trade higher or above 10-year yields. And that's called yield curve inversion. So every time that that relationship moves below the zero line there, that's inversion of the curve. And interestingly, if you have a look at this, gray shaded lines show you recessions in the US. So every recession we've had since the 50s, and you can see that the yield curve has inverted just before a recession every single time. There are reasons for that. The reasons are that um, generally it's at a time when um, the Federal Reserve is increasing rates quite aggressively, which then has an impact on growth. Longer dated yields rally because they're sensitive to growth, and that's why all of this happens. But you can see recently um, that green line is becoming um, lower and lower, and this hasn't been updated for maybe three months, but not long ago, about two months ago, the US curve did invert. It's gone positive again, but did invert briefly. And there was everywhere, you know, Financial Times all over the world, these discussions of, is a recession coming? The yield curve is inverted. So once again, very useful information to have about the economic cycle by having a look at a snapshot of a, a country's yield curve. 
Right, moving swiftly on. So that's a lot on fixed rate bonds. There are obviously other coupon types as well. So when we looked at that pie chart, we saw most of the market in South Africa were fixed rate bonds, but we also had other coupon types. And let's discuss inflation linked bonds. So here we have um, bonds which have coupons that aren't fixed. So you don't get 10% every year. You, your payments, your coupon payments are linked to an inflation index. So you're going to get a coupon that is adjusted for inflation. Inflation. Um, and if we have a look at an example of how the cash flows look, you'll recall that for our fixed rate bond, we had the 10% fixed coupon every single year. For an inflation linked bond, do you have a fixed coupon that is much lower? For example, it's just say 4%, but every year you're going to get that 4% fixed coupon plus whatever inflation was for that year. So if inflation is going much higher, your coupon will adjust higher accordingly. If inflation is coming lower, your coupon will adjust lower accordingly. And on maturity date, you're going to get both your principal amount and your large coupon adjusted for inflation. So it takes inflation out of the equation. You don't have to worry about inflation. You get a constant real return. How does that differ to a fixed rate bond? Well, just look at the last bullet point here. Um, if fixed rate bond carries inflation risk. So if you are earning 10% on your bond and inflation is much higher, say that that is 12% over the time and not um, and you're only earning 10%, you're going to have a negative real return once you've adjusted for inflation. If inflation is much lower, you're going to have a positive real return. But there's nothing you can do about that dynamic. You are locked into that fixed rate. An inflation-linked bond makes sure that you're always getting a constant real return can be very, very useful to include in a portfolio. If we have a look at South Africa once again, we've got that SA yield curve on nominal bonds, the so normal fixed rate bonds um, at the top, so the red line. And we've shown you here the inflation linked bond curve in South Africa in blue. So those are real yields. The blue line will get adjusted for inflation. The red line doesn't. That's a fixed rate bond that you're investing in. So every single maturity, we've shown you the difference between bonds that mature in 30 years, in 20 years, in 10 years. So you've got like for like points to compare. The difference between those two curves is a term that we call break even inflation. So if you're invested um, in a nominal bond and you think that that break even inflation is very, very wide. So the difference between what you can get for a real yield for say, let's just take the 20 year point. You can get a 4% real yield, but you can get 11% on a nominal yield. The difference between those two 11 minus four is 6%. That's your break even inflation. If you think inflation is going to be lower than that over the next 20 years, you want the nominal bond. You're getting compensated more in the nominal bond. If you think inflation is going to be higher than 6%, then you want to invest in the inflation linked bond at the real yield. So that when we talk about break even inflation, that's all we're talking about. It's just the difference between the two curves. And that you can either use that as an outright decision to say, well, I'm taking a view on where inflation will be, and I think one is better than the other. Or alternatively, and how we often use inflation linked bonds in our portfolios is we all say, right, we think nominal bonds are attractive, but what if inflation does move higher? We want a little bit of a hedge against that, so we can buy some portion of inflation linked bonds as a hedge, just in case inflation does move higher in the near term. So it's a very useful tool to have in one's portfolio. So we've done fixed rate bonds, we've done um, inflation linked bonds. Another large um, component in the market is what we call floating or variable rate bonds, floating rate notes. And this is most of South African corporate bond market issuance. And it pays a variable, a floating interest rate that moves with market rates. So it resets to a very short dated rate and pays you a spread above that. So most of the floating rate notes in South Africa are linked to something called the three month jive R rate. And that's a rate that then every three months, your investment or your coupon is going to reset to wherever the, three, the rate, the next reset rate is. So three months from the last reset rate, your rate will reset and you will get paid a fixed spread above that. So using an example, if rates are 5% today, the repo rate increases by a percent and goes up to 6% in three months time. In three months from today, your coupon will reset to 6% plus the additional spread, the fixed margin on top of that. Let's just use an example of 2% here. So you would have earned 5 plus 2% for your first coupon, 7%. Rates have gone up a percent for your next coupon reset date. You will earn 6% 
as your reference rate plus the two, which will give you 8%. So you can see how that moves over time. And because it's constantly resetting to a market rate, there's very little duration risk on these instruments. So there's nothing, you know, market rates, you are resetting to the market rate all the time. So you don't have that duration component you have in fixed rate bonds. What you do have is that 200 basis point spread we used in this example, where you invested on day one, you said, I want market rates plus 200, 2% for that risk. If that risk changes to say, 3% for the same type of issuance a year later, and you're only earning 2%, that's where your price volatility could come into the equation. So that fixed margin is normally a credit spread, and most corporate bonds are priced in this way. Floating rate notes are no interest rate risk, but a credit spread. Um, Mike, I um, wanted to pause here for you. I think you wanted to put a poll up. Yeah, thanks, Melanie. So our last poll, uh, and thanks for the feedback on the last one. It was a 50-50. It was quite an interesting response. The, the latest poll, which I'm going to launch now, is where will repo rates settle post the hiking cycle? So where do we think they're going to get to uh, once the Saab has done all the increases which are potentially on the table? So I'll let that one run and uh, look forward to your feedback. Interesting responses so far. Fantastic. Thanks, Mike. So um, essentially what we wanted to show you here is that in a floating rate note, you're always resetting to market rates in terms of your coupon every three months. The only thing that um, the risk that you run is that the spread that you earn on day one, um, the market rate for that spread could change over time. But here, three month jive up, which will get phased out, but currently this is the reference rate used for floating rate notes, very, very close to where short dated interest rates are with the repo rate. So there's very little market risk that you run with floating rate note investments. Right, so that's a lot on coupon type. Um, we wanted to quickly run through the second pillar. So we said characteristics, you're always going to have a coupon type, an issuer type, and a maturity date. What different types of issuer types do you get? Um, and here, there's a whole range. Um, you can get a government bond, you can get a bond issued, investment bond issued by a state-owned enterprise, like a Transnet or an ESCOM. Um, you could invest in a, a bond issued by a municipality. Doesn't really happen in South Africa very much, but in the US, there's a huge muni, muni market, as an example. Banks issue a lot of bonds in, into the domestic market. Corporates issue bonds. And you also get project bonds where you can invest in a bond where your um, coupon um, is earned from project cash flows that are received from a particular project. So what does it look like in South Africa? Once again, Shwebi took everything listed on the JSE and she sliced it and diced it in different ways. Here she said, well, who is the issuer of the bond? And you can see the line share. So, you know, three quarters of the market is an SA government issuance in the red. We do have some issuance by banks who do use the corporate bond market a lot. And then other corporates um, are a much smaller issuer. Sometimes that's a lot larger in South Africa right now. They're quite small in terms of the mix. And so that enterprises, which used to be a very large issuer like Eskom and Transnet, there hasn't been much demand for their paper lately. So they've become a smaller part of the pie. So what is a corporate bond? Sorry, if we could just move to the poll quickly. Um, most people think that uh, the repo rate's gonna peak between six and 7%. So we are absolutely with you in that. We think that rates are gonna get somewhere between six to six and a half before the terminal rate in this cycle. Um, and current years, yeah, it's even, kind of evenly split between there and five to 6% with some thinking that risk could increase even further and the repo rate could peak above 7%. Market pricing actually has around 7%, we think between six to six and a half percent. So really interesting what, how that split works. So what is a corporate bond? Up until now, we've been speaking about government bonds. What is a corporate bond? And it's a debt instrument issued by a non-government entity. And if that corporate doesn't pay, that constitutes a legal default. And when I say if they don't pay, if they don't pay interest or the coupon when it's due and or the principal or the maturity amount when it's due, that's a legal default. You can take them to court and you can enforce that contract. As we were discussing earlier, looking at a share versus bond, um, bondholders have senior claim over preference shareholders or common, or common equity, normal equity holders. 
Um, and when you're looking at a corporate bond, it's really important for you to figure out where you are on a corporate balance sheet. So bonds of the same issuer can have different seniorities, always senior to equity and preference shares, but can have different seniorities relative to each other. So if we look at the right hand side of this chart, you can get bonds that are secured. So um, they have assets which are ring fenced, which are used to repay yourself as the investor. That's the lowest type of risk of corporate bond. You can have senior unsecured. So you're right at the top. You just don't have particular security in your favor. You can be subordinated. So you only get paid after those above you in the capital structure. And you can also be junior. So if you, for example, say I'm investing in a center bank bond, that doesn't really mean anything until you figure out where you are on this capital structure. Which, what type of seniority do you have as a bond investor in the standard bank balance sheet? When you're investing in corporate bonds, you think of two different types of risk. You think to yourself, well, what is my default risk? What is the risk that I'm not going to be paid in full? So I'm not going to get 100% of my coupons and my principal back. And what is the risk I don't get paid on time? If someone doesn't pay me for a certain coupon period, how do I factor that into my calculation? And when we're determining default risk, we think about it in two different ways. We think, what is the probability of default? So what is the chance that this particular corporate issuer is going to default? And if they do default, what am I going to lose? So I'm not going to lose my entire investment, but what do I think my loss is going to be if there is a default? And those two components together drive initial credit spreads. And then, as we said, you know, you issue a bond today at a particular credit spread and at a particular yield, things then change. So things can change the different credit risk of that company or in the industry that it operates in. That change in credit risk over the life of the bond is called credit spread risk. Um, which is some, another fact that you need to take into consideration when investing in, in, in corporate bonds. It could be company specific, deteriorating um, financials. It could be something to do with the economic cycle. Interest rates increase significantly and that particular company um, experiences stress. It could be something specific to the industry, like the property industry during COVID. Um, or it could be specific market risk appetite that actually all credit spreads are moving higher or moving lower. Um, and those are the types of factors that we need to consider um, when we're thinking about credit risk. Shwebi, I'm going to hand over to you just to run through some more details on corporate bonds. Thank you, Mel. Thank you. I hope everyone can hear me. So just to continue on on what Melanie has said. So we know that with any sort of investment, you know, one has to be mindful that you are going to assume some level of risk. So she touched on corporate bonds. So we're thinking about it. Um, so think about like uh, South African government bonds, for an example. So your risk there will be exposed to the sovereign. And I think we mentioned this earlier um, in, the, in the presentation that we're thinking, okay, if your exposure is to the sovereign, what is our South Africa's credit rating? So where does our fiscal stand? What's our balance sheet looking like? So it's very similar now to, um, I think with, we can apply the same to corporate bonds. So if I think about a corporate bonds, you just think about the risk band, right? So the higher up you go into the risk band, so the greater the, the, greater the risk that you're going to assume. Yes, you're gonna get a higher yield, uh, similar to uh, sovereign bonds like the R2-2048, for example. So the, its maturity profile is a bond that matures in 2048. So that risk is slightly elevated because, you know, one cannot focus really um, what, what you're going to get in terms of credit risk in 30, 40 years time. So, but it doesn't spell. So you have to, as an investor now, you have to be constant you have to be compensated, you know, that that's where risk premium comes in. But now high yielding bonds are not really all doom and gloom. Okay, there's some good news into it because so you yes, you're getting a high yield, but now what does it mean to your portfolio? So they do act as instruments like high yielding instruments act as, um, you know, yield enhancers. But most importantly, I think to eliminate concentration risk, because the portfolio of um, a bond portfolio may not necessarily be invested only in South African government bonds. So we like to diversify. So we have a multitude of universe, you know, we can go higher corporate bill bonds, which we know they tend to, their ratings are slightly lower in the ratings band. I know we're gonna cover this on the other slide, but they do act as a diversifier into your portfolio. So you putting, you diverse, you essentially not putting your egg in one basket on this one. So I think we can uh, move on to the next slide, Mel. Alrighty then. So in terms of credit assessment, now we think about credit in a very dynamic way. So this is where 
is we're taking it now one layer further. We're getting to more details into the fun stuff of analyzing, you know, credit. And maybe I think we should have put um, a rainbow flow chart just to make things a bit more colorful in this one. So what we're trying to illustrate here is essentially the multiple approaches that you can take, but there are seven key focus areas. And when we're thinking about introducing credit, I'm just thinking about corporate credit now, if you want to introduce corporate credit into our portfolios, we like to go through with the seven these key focus areas. And I'll just briefly run through them. All. I'm very mindful of the time. So if you think about it now, financial statement analysis. Now, this I like to think is the core and is the foundation of everything because we need to understand how the status of the health of the company that we're going to be possibly lending money to. You know, as Melanie mentioned earlier, as an investor, you need to know, um, am I going to get my money back? If I'm lending this corporate, maybe there's a, they're offering a three-year corporate paper, am I going to get my money back at the end of the day? And that's the, and you need to understand also, you know, can the issuer meet its financial uh, obligations? So this is where the assessment of cash flow is coming in, you know, how geared um, so you scrutinize these financial statements, but putting your bond hat on, you know, like thinking about credit buffers, um, I mean, pardon me, cash buffers and think about leverage, you know, how geared the company is. So we spend a lot of time just thinking about that from liquidity perspective when it comes to fixed income. So just moving along, the next point. So covenants, I like to think more of, they are like your T's and C's, okay? There are certain provisions that are embedded in credit transaction whereby now the issuer, in this case is someone who's borrowing. So this could be a company, this could be a sovereign. They come, they will explicitly stipulate, okay, this is our commitment as a borrower to the market, right? And then you also find that there's another layer in those covenants. So I'm just thinking now in terms of the REIT space, in terms of the property space. So they, what you call a negative, negative covenant. So this is whereby they go to state. Now they, I mean the issuer or the borrower will, will apply so there are limits and restrictions that they cannot go above. So if you think of a property company, so like loan to value ratio, so management will say, we'll keep it in this range, like 30 to 35%. And so should it trigger or should they, should they breach? You know, as investors we've got, um, we know what those levels are. So that's why we need to always scrutinize, you know, understanding of what those terms and conditions are. And now moving on to management. So as an investor, I'm just trying to, to think of a better example is think of the parastatals, right? The state-owned entities. If you have frequent change in management, you know, in a space of five years, I don't want to say ESCOM, but dare I say, um, we have a change of management constantly. Every year there's a change of management. So it doesn't foster much confidence. So, you know, you need to have credible management and this the Lorium, you know, as part of our fixed income uh, capabilities, we are fortunate enough to have an equi equity team that can leverage off that information. You know, these guys, they spend a sufficient amount of time meeting with, if, for example, if we're interested in a corporate, you know that there's an assigned equity analyst to it that has spent sufficient time that we think, like maybe six months to a year, just dealing with management. So there's an understanding. We have to be comfortable that this is a solid, solid management company that you can lend money to. And then um, scenario to have claim. Now, this one is very interesting um, because I like to think when it comes to credit assessment, I like to think that um, not all creditors are created or treated equally here. So that's, that's, that's your background that you need to think about. So as bondholders, if you think of a credit hierarchy, I like to think of as a pyramid, right? I think Melanie did mention this earlier um, in the previous slide. So if you think of a credit hierarchy, your most senior debt holders will sit on top. So should anything befall the company, you know, it, it, it no longer can be able to fulfill its financial obligations or it goes under liquidation. So your senior debt holders have the first claim when it comes to payments. So, and then I think we, re, we did show this slide in the previous slide, I think with senior debt holders, you know, subordination and, and unsecured um, debt. So you need to understand if you are going to produce credit into your portfolio, where do you lie? Where do you lie into that credit hierarchy? Okay, and then just moving on in terms of this is very simplistic time period of investment. It can be put into categories. So short term, mid to long term. So short term, if I'm thinking about it, um, you find that you've got treasury bills that are issued by the government. They're normally from uh, three to 12 months. So that's your short term investments and then your 
mid to long term, I'm thinking more along the lines of, um, you know, three to five years and then five years plus. So that's still, um, so you have to be mindful of what period of, of investment are you going to be invested in. Okay, then moving along to the bond documentation. So whenever we're thinking about um, corporate bonds in specific, specifically, there are legal documentation that it's, 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 it's an agreement between an issuer and its investors. So one example I can think of is the APS, which is the Applicable Pricing Supplement Document. So before a deal is listed via the JSE, you know, there has to be some legal agreement just to hold both parties to task and say, okay, this is the instrument that we're going to issue. This is the maturity of the profile. So you need that, um, that evidence, if you will. And then just moving along to the last factor um, that we consider the industry drivers. So if you're going to lend to any sort of corporate, you need to understand what is the economic landscape, you know, because some companies operate in a cyclical and other cyclical cycle, uh, uh, factors, and then others are very structural. So it's just understanding those industry dynamics, the macro side of things will, uh, will be a useful part of your credit assessment. So I think we can move on to the next one. Now, okay, taking it now locally to South African banks. I think in South Africa, we are very fortunate to have, I think, one of the most um, highly regarded institutions, which is the South African Reserve Bank. Now, the SAAB acts as the regulator, so they are the enforcer um, of regulation to the banking institution. So they put measures in place. So if you take it back a little bit in global financial crisis, um, you know, uh, excuse me. Um, so essentially, they put provisions in place to protect investors. Okay, there are certain requirements that banks must meet and they must constantly meet. So just think about 2020 now, what's been hap well, what happened there during the pandemic is that banks have to have the ability to absorb um, you know, any sort of losses without, in without disturbing, I think, um, the consumer's, uh, the consumer's um, uh, lifestyle there. So for example, uh, we've got capital adequacy ratio. So this, the bottom left chart, so the SOG will say, okay, there's a 10%, I'm thinking, should have drawn the line there, but there's um, the requirement there for those capital adequacy uh, ratios. It's it's ten percent around ten percent. You can already see from all the top five banks, um, there's they are trading above those requirements. So you know that should anything before financial stress in the industry, we know that banks are capable of holding their own. And we've seen that. You know, we didn't hear of any bank defaults. You know, in twenty twenty because they've got sufficient capital buffers that um, as per regulation. Okay, so now taking it back a bit offshore. So this is the US high yield spread. And what we're trying to illustrate here is just to showcase the evolution of our credit spreads um, during very heightened stress uh, events. So here we've got 2008 that we all know, the global financial crisis, how spreads have moved just to, to specify, maybe just to labor on this a little bit. So high yielding spreads, you, if you look thinking about um, a credit band, so triple A is on top, so that's our investment grade. And this one is more concentrating on the lower end of that credit bucket, which is your double Bs, your double B minus. But I know we're going to have a slide just to explain um, how that goes. So you can immediately see how the deterioration and um, the lack of liquidity in market caused those double B plus, you know, double B minus uh, corporate spares in the US to surge almost 20%. But now the difference is this. So like in 2020, you know, during the pandemic, yes, they did um, widen a little bit, but during the period, I think post and pre-COVID, you've seen that the spread is slightly depressed. Now that's because that's, that's where the intervention of the central banks comes in. You know, they're going to inject liquid into the market and then you're going to immediately see um, credit spreads narrow uh, during that time. Obviously the health of the economy plays a big role in how corporates um, issue. So you find that the band, you know, um, your credit spreads are going to narrow a little bit, but uh, should they be financial distress, you're going to see the spreads that widen up a little bit there. Okay, to now I'm just trying to, so the similar picture, just taking it domestically here. So what would be driving, if I'm thinking about the question, what would be driving this credit spreads lower, especially post COVID? So in South Africa, the dynamic is slightly different because it's driven by supply and demand. So what happened before COVID is that, you know, um, pardon me, during COVID is that these companies really, 
have accumulated so much cash that they don't feel the need to come into market and issue as much, which we've seen that in the level of issuance, like pre and post COVID. So pre COVID, companies were coming into market, raising and financing and all of that. But now post COVID, you know, banks have got enough money, they, they, they're holding on to it. And so they're not going to issue. What happens is that the supply dynamic, the supply demand dynamic, you know, impacts the credit spreads. So you'll find that. There's an over there's there's a, there's a there's lack of supply but more demand. So we all I think everyone maybe have heard this terminology of like we're all hunting for yield. So essentially that's where it applies. We find that in these auctions, pardon me. So in these auctions, there's there's less paper now available. But now people as investors we're just trying to hunt for yield. So it just depresses those uh, corporate spreads, uh, as you illustrated there in the slide. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Shev. That was really um, a quick but very thorough breeze through um, how we think about corporate bonds in the portfolio and credit risk. Thank you so much for that. In the interest of time, I know we haven't got much time left. I'm just going to breeze through um, the following slides quite quickly. But the obvious question I think that we get asked a lot is that, you know, we spoke about corporate bonds. Corporate bonds, if, if a corporate runs into trouble, they can go to their shareholders to try to raise equity. Uh, but that's kind of all they have to do. And if they can't raise equity to set the ship right, then they're going to have to go into default and wind down um, their balance sheet or go into business rescue. Can a government bond default? It's a question that comes up all the time. It's very, very uncommon. And if you think about it, a government bond is quite different to corporate. It's got a much wider toolbox. So if it is running into financial difficulty, it can it can increase its revenues uh, by law. It can raise taxes to do that. It can also decrease expenditure. So it's got tools or levers that it can pull. Um, but generally, when a, a sovereign default occurs, it's triggered by if the sovereign has borrowed too much in a foreign currency. So if you think about South Africa, we don't have much um, dollar debt on our balance sheet. A lot of it is domestic. And technically, you don't want this to happen. But technically, if you ran into a lot of difficulty, you could even print more of your own money to pay your obligations. That's clearly not a good outcome because that would create lots of money supply, which would cause inflation, which would weaken the rand. So that's not a good scenario, but to actually default is quite tricky. However, if you've got a lot of dollar denominated debt as a country, you can't print dollars. That's when you run into trouble. But if you do run into trouble, there are a lot more um, avenues that you can follow. There are lots of friendly lenders who can set you back on the right course again. And we've seen the IMF play a really important role in this regard um, and the World Bank and African Development Bank who can not only give you some funding support to get through tough times, they can also give you really important policy support. So that's a bit different. Um, and if you are in deep distress and you just got too much debt, think about Zambia who defaulted in November 2020, they're going through a restructuring process right now, you, they will have to restructure their debt Bond investors will take some sort of haircut, but the government continues. The government doesn't go into business rescue. It doesn't get wound down. So the entity does continue, right sizes its debt, and then moves on. So it's quite a different process. So Schwab's mentioned um, rating this relative rating. So what is a triple A bond? What is a triple B bond? What is high yield? So very briefly, just to run through um, some of those concepts, these will be familiar to you. Um, there are a set of independent um, rating agencies in the market. And what they will do is for those of us who um, are looking to compare different types of bonds in different markets, rating agencies provide a very, very valuable role. Essentially what they do is they provide independent credit analysis and they assign a relative ranking to everything in the world, um, any type of debt issue. The larger agencies are names that we're familiar to. There's Moody's, Standard & Poor's, and Fitch in particular. And it allows for easy comparison. So you can have a look at this waterfall or the scale. Essentially, um, a rating agency will take every single bond and say, what is its risk? Is it triple A? Is it, for example, double B? So if you look, triple A to triple B on the top is known as investment grade quality. If you are assigned a double B rating, it's a non-investment grade all the way down to C. A very unkind word for that is junk bonds or high yield bonds. Um, and as you move to the bottom of the scale, you can be into default. Important to note two things. One is that these ratings move over time. It's not static. A rating agency will assess the risk with either upgrade, uh, an issuer 
towards the top of the scale or downgrade them towards the bottom of the scale so you can move around these different buckets. Um, and another important point is that you must always make sure you are choosing the right rating scale. So you get a national rating scale where everything within one country is compared to each other. For example, in South Africa, the government would be triple A right at the top and everything else would be relative to that. Or you can have a global scale rating where you're comparing across the world. So South Africa um, isn't at the top of the pyramid on a global scale. It's sitting at double B, which is the that top end of the non-investment grade category, whereas the US government on a global scale would be at the top, triple A. So those are just some technicalities there, but rating agency is really useful. And you can see how these move over time. Here we've shown you the rating, um, the, the sovereign rating of SA government, how that's moved over time. The white band at the top is investment grade, gray at the bottom is sub-investment grade. You can see how over time from 94 until where we are right now, we were upgraded by rating agencies up to the top end, our credit quality was improving. And then sort of in the Zuma period, things kind of went off the rails and we saw a sharp sudden loss of our credit ratings momentum and it fell into the sub-investment gray area category. For the first time in ages, we feel that we are almost at the end of that road. We actually saw on Friday night, Senate and Impose didn't upgrade us, but they changed our rating outlook to positive because of the terms of trade and because of structural reforms. Um, and that's good. <laughs> but that essentially shows you that you know, rating agent ratings absolutely move over time. And it's a quick check of one credit risk relative to another. The last concept we'll very briefly touch on is, you know, we said how every single bond has three characteristics. It's got a coupon type, it's got an issuer type, and it's got a maturity date. There's a new category of bond investments, which is exploded in the world called ESG bonds. They have all three of those characteristics, but the use of the proceeds that those bonds raise gets used for environmental, social government gov governance purposes. And the three most um, obvious examples of that is um, a corporate or a government could raise a bond and say, I'm going to use these proceeds, proceeds to invest in solar projects that would be a green bond, or I'm gonna use these proceeds, proceeds to um, provide affordable housing loans like Standard Bank did recently, um, that would be a social bond, or property companies, example, could say I'm raising a bond and then if I meet certain carbon emissions deadlines by certain dates, my coupon can move lower. If I meet those targets, that would be a sustainability linked bond. Those are the three key um, types of ESG bonds that are an issue. Globally, the market has exploded, as you can see on this chart, um, absolutely took off in 2020 and 2021. Similar trend in South Africa, once again, we take all the bonds in the JSC. But you can see that although there was a lot of interest in insurance in 21, and we've seen some in 22, it's still a teeny, 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 tiny part of the market. If you look at the pie chart, ESG related bonds are only um, less than 1% of the, the bonds in issue. But watch this space. It certainly is a, a growing asset class. Right, we're almost out of time. So I'm just going to run through to the very end. Um, Mike showed at the, at the start, you know, when we talk about bonds and all of these factors that drive bonds, it's very important in our asset allocation process. Depending on the mandate of the fund that we run, they, um, there are a lot of our portfolios that have got significant bond exposure. We move this up and down depending on what we think the market forces are that are driving the fair value for bond investments. Right now, we are constructive on bond valuations. We think there's a risk premium we want to take advantage of. Um, and we've got a, a reasonable, a very healthy weighting towards the bonds as an asset class in our portfolios. And if we just pause on the multi-asset income fund, which is all fixed, pretty much all fixed income, um, we, being a multi-asset income fund, is a, a much lower volatility fund. We're not going to have as many long-dated bonds in a fund like this than you would find in the other portfolios that we manage. Um, essentially, in a fund like this, we say, we think that your neutral weighting should be about 20% in bonds and the rest in money market income fund type instruments. We think about it in terms of a duration risk budget, which we want to keep quite low. A money market fund will have a duration of maybe three months, a bond fund maybe seven years. We think a fund like this should be somewhere between half a year and two years. But within that risk budget, we want to be able to harness these attractive bond valuations. And you can see in terms of our current portfolio construct, bottom left, 
South African government bonds are 30% of the portfolio. So these are fixed rate bonds that we were discussing, a lot of them in the very short end of the curve where we think that interest rates being priced by the market are too high relative to our expectations. But if you just have a quick look around this and we can take this discussion offline with anyone who's interested, you can see we've got all sorts of different types of bonds in here. We've got inflation linked bonds in the very short end of the curve to provide us with inflation protection. We've got short dated fixed rate, slightly longer dated fixed rate, short dated floating rate, slightly longer data floating rate bonds, we've got corporate bonds and we've got NCDs which are instruments issued by banks. We've also got some offshore bonds as well um, to provide a bit of a, a range hedge in the portfolio. So it's a it's a smorgasbord of different types of, of all of these bonds that we've been discussing represented in a mandate um, which is a reasonably low risk mandate, um, how we've expressed that view. Right, I think we're pretty close to the end. So Mike, I'm just gonna hand back to you. Great, if you can finish just on one more slide there, Mel. Thanks everybody, it's time has flown. I think we've, we've done double the time that we usually do and we still filled it uh, pretty comprehensively and I hope you all learned a lot with us today. Well done to all of those who, who were tuned in and paying attention and looking for that word. I see that uh, it came up relatively early even before Shwebi managed to chime in on her uh, color ranging rainbow. So well done to Dirk Smuts, who uh, won the bottle of uh, Lorien Blend for today, 2016. It'll be on, on its way to you soon. So thanks very much, everybody. We do have some questions in the Q&A. Um, we maybe have time just for one of them, and then the others we'll respond to directly. But maybe the first one which came in, which is what is the typical maturity date on the bonds included in the Lorien funds, and how do we mitigate that sort of duration risk. I think Melanie has shown that on that previous slide, how things, how we diversify the portfolio, and she can maybe answer a little bit more on that. But maybe just to mention while we're on that last slide, we really have uh, a fantastic fund. It has been running for over seven years, uh, which Melanie has been managing it. You'll see through those returns, it's very defensive, very um, consistent. And even in that huge pullback we saw back in March, 2020, she was only down 2.1% in that month and ending with a fantastic return for the year of 8.3. So if you're looking for a cornerstone um, opportunity to invest in, in an income product, which will give your, your underlying investors consistent returns, then please do come chat to us. We're happy to engage with you and, and meet on a more one-on-one -on -one basis. But back to Mel, and then we'll close off after that. Great, right, thank you. So just um, it's going to be quite a quick answer to answer the question justice because obviously it's, it's a fantastic question. But in each of the portfolios that we run, you know, we have um, a specific what we call um, a duration target um, in a neutral setting, and we will either be overweight or underweight or um, medium weight that duration depending on where we are in the cycle so we've got very predefined guardrails that we move within and then depending on where um, yields are trading in the market relative to where we feel fair value should be we'll either be overweight or neutral or underweight um, bonds as an asset class we can use any bonds that we like and, and most of these funds as long as we're meeting that duration budget which is the interest rate volatility in the fund um, we can look for opportunities across the entire curve. And I think that's important because we're lucky as South African investors. We have this deep, liquid, long-dated yield curve. And there'll be times when there are clear opportunities in one part of the curve relative to the other. And we want to be able to use that in our toolbox and be able to change our exposure depending on where we see the value. And all of that gets, gets um, included in our duration thinking. So the, we always have the risk constraint overlaid. That means that we calculate our portfolio duration at all points in time. So we don't take on excessive risk relative to what the mandate constraint should be. So that's a bit of a wordy answer. Essentially where we're seeing value right now across the curve, we're seeing pockets of value pretty much throughout the curve. So we feel a bit spoiled for choice. Sometimes we, we really don't see value everywhere, but remember we have this very, very steep yield curve pricing and a lot of risk, which there are risks. So we think there should be a risk premium that you get compensated with, but we think that risk premium is quite wide. And if you're earning an 11% yield on the long um, end of the curve, we think that that is a very powerful anchor, very powerful real yield for you to include in your portfolio, provided you think that that risk premium is sufficient for the risk we face, and we do. So you'll see that in those portfolios um, that can stretch their legs a little bit in bond positioning, we will have longer dated bonds. 
We certainly also like the 10 year point of the curve and we really like the short end of the curve as well, because we think that the risk premium for um, interest rate hikes being priced into the curve, we agree it should be there, but we think it's too high. So we also like positioning and bonds out to sort of five year point of the curve where, where yields are um, very attractive relative to what we think the path of interest rates will be. I Thanks, that's Paul. I'm sure you could go on forever. <laughs> I could. <laughs> we definitely, I could. We definitely have uh, run out of time at this point. Thank you so much to everybody. Well done to Shrebi. Well done to Mel. I hope you're all feeling a bit more informed about bonds and be can better converse and educate your own clients um, after today. We will send out the presentation and the recording and the, the CPD points. We'll try and get out as soon as possible. Obviously, I that, that uh, time, that clock is ticking in terms of the, the cutoff for that too. So thank you everybody. Well done to Dirk and we'll see you next time. Have a good week further. Thank, thank you. you so much, everyone.